coming up for NAMI. Okay. So uh, what's coming up for NAMI is we have some free eight-week family-to-family classes starting here in January. If you want to treat yourself to an education as a family member, please, please go online and sign up for our free classes. We have five or six family support groups every week. We have two, I think two or three peer-to-peer -peer support groups every week. So please avail yourself of our free services. We know how expensive psychiatric illnesses are, so we offer everything for free. And for just a second, I want to introduce you to our executive director, Erin Raftery. Erin, would you like to say a word or two? You're Erin. muted. Okay. Hey, thank you. Just took me a second there. Um, thank you, Sharon. And um, just welcome everyone to our first uh, speaker series of January or of the year 2022. I, I really can't believe that it's already 2022, but thank you all for being here with us this evening. I see we have a lot of participants this evening, so it's a really wonderful way to kick off our Janice Blackwater speaker series. I see that Janice is here, so thank you, Janice, and round of applause to her. Um, so to make these speaker series possible to bring in great guests like we have this evening. Um, and also a big round of applause for our, um, our president, our board president, Sharon Dunas. So thank you, Sharon, for hosting this evening, sure. and creating a warm, welcoming environment for all of us to share. So thank you. And I want to welcome Elizabeth Stevens to our outreach coordinator who does so much for NAMI Westside LA. So I want to thank you, Elizabeth, and you too, Aaron. And without further ado, I want to introduce you to Dr. Michael Leviton. I have known Dr. Michael Leviton probably for 20 years of my life. Uh, when, when I didn't know who he was, he and I shared a patient, a couple, that had been ordered to him by court to solve this couple's problems. And this couple was potentially very violent with each other. They created lots of trauma for each other. And I thought this couple will never make it. And bit by bit, Dr. Leventon worked with them, worked with her, and bit by bit, they got well. And they were able to relate to each other. And that rage attacks kind of slowed down and stopped. That couple is still married. They're a vi very viable couple in Beverly Hills doing a, a lot for charity and doing a lot of business in Beverly Hills and have a slew of friends. And I credit you, Dr. Leviton, with saving that couple's life. And that was my first experience with you. Thank you. And then we, then we uh, invited Dr. Leviton to be our speaker. We used to have the Pathways Conferences, yes. one up at the Jewish University. And Dr. Leviton spoke on his favorite talkie which is managing anger and dealing with anger and working with anger issues within the family system. And then I think you, you spoke again at another Pathways right. conference for us. Do you remember which one that was? No, I, but it might've been on, <laughs> I have a lot of favorite subjects, by the way. It might've been on PTSD. It might've been, it might've been. So I, I do a lot of talks on that, yeah. And Michael Everton is, uh, T really talented. He is, uh, people refer to him to manage anger throughout the county. I think he's getting referrals uh, from the Department of Mental Health and is really in, involved as a known entity for ma anger management within family systems. And I give you this talented speaker, Dr. Michael Leviton, who's speaking on anger during the pandemic and how to relate to it and what to do with it. And welcome, welcome, Dr. Leviton. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that very much. I hope I can live up to your uh, introduction. Uh, I also specialize in, uh, as you referred earlier with the couple, with a lot of domestic violence work and child abuse work and uh, post-traumatic stress and uh, school violence and um, sex trafficking, suicide, I've been presenting on for the last couple of years. 
and I'm very involved in this, not just for treatment, but uh, some activism. I belong to many organizations and I just want to see peace in the family and peace in the world. So without further ado, uh, shall I uh, share my PowerPoint? Can I start with that? Yes, 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 welcome. Okay. It's an honor okay. to have you speak for us. Thank you so much. Uh, is, does everyone see it now? Is it shared or not? Sure. No, not yet. Dr. It's not shared yet. Okay. So let me minimize it. And oh, okay. I see what to do now. There we go. This should work, hopefully. Our new, not so new, but our the age of yes. Zoom. Yes. We have a, we have a, a, the age of Zoom is upon us. So I want to wish everyone a happy new year. I appreciate your uh, checking in on this presentation. I very much appreciate Sharon as she was so kind to me uh, over the years and in the introduction. And I so appreciate the work you've been doing for so many years, Sharon, and you're very dedicated. I know many people professionally and you're as dedicated as they come. And, and we need that now, thank you. So I'm going to uh, start. Now I submitted several titles for Sharon and Sharon like this one. We all have lots to be angry about, the key is to manage it. But as Erin reminded me in the email she sent, uh, what we're doing, focusing on is anger management with mental illness in the family. So I added that parenthetically, but it's a, a major theme of my talk tonight. And uh, I'm gonna move on along with the slides. And uh, what do I have to do to advance it? It's not advancing right now. Anyone have any uh, suggestions for how to advance the slide? It happened to me once before, page up, page down. Try hitting your space bar. Wait, how about this? Okay, I think I have to use, you know what it is? It's a PowerPoint that's an older version. So I may, it may take me a while to advance each slide, but hopefully I'll get the job done and, and, we'll, and all of us will gain something. Uh, some of this you might know, you might be familiar with. Hopefully you'll learn new things that you can apply uh, in your life, in your practice, in your families. So this is just an overview of what I'm gonna be talking about. I'm gonna be talking obviously about anger management and anger and what it is and different types of anger, destructive, constructive, the roots of our dealing with anger, uh, and then talk about mental illness in the family and how that intersects with anger, talk about caretakers, and then some basic anger management tools hopefully we can take away. Oh, now it advanced by itself, that's great. So I often use this slide uh, near the, the beginning of my presentations. I love those who go under for they are those who cross over. Meaning when you go through something, something mean, meaningful in your life, a hardship, an obstacle, when you cross over and, and whether you've had a sickness whether you've had a loss in your life, whether you have a family member who's had a sickness, a friend, a loss, any trauma really, when you go through that and learn from it, get therapy if you need that, however you can go through it, not over it, not skip over it, you can cross over to a deeper level of living, a deeper level of compassion for others, I believe. So, Here's some basics. We tend to get angry when we feel, and you can add to this list, but these are some of the, the main ones, mistreated, offended, wronged, insulted, slighted, denied, ignored, challenged, provoked, violated. And different degrees of anger for each. But these are some of the main triggers that makes us get angry in the first place. Anger seems to be a bad word. Most people deny their anger. Awareness of anger is the first step to manage it. By the way, I chose this photo because I was looking at Google images and some of the men and women, they showed the angry faces. It was just too real and ugly. 
Anger can be quite ugly. It can also be constructive. We'll get to that. So I chose this sort of cartoonish figure here. But I want to explain what, the, what I mean by this a little. I've come across, not just in my practice, but with people I know who will deny anger, deny that they're angry. People will come to me and say, um, oh God, I'm just so frustrated. I'm so annoyed, but I'm not angry. And that's the one word people seem to deny in this, uh, of the emotions. They may say frustrated or upset, annoyed, irritated, but I'm not angry. And that's why I said most people deny their anger. However, awareness of anger is the first step to manage. You have to own your anger. So if you feel upset, you may say, oh, I'm just a little upset. There could very well be some anger in that. If you've had a loss in your life, if you've had so many different things, a, a sickness, there's often some anger in it. People are very quick to deny anger and the word anger. But if you want to manage it, you have to own it as yours. And then you could work through it and do a better job of managing it. When you deny it, it's going to creep up on you and you're going to act out the anger in ways you don't enjoy. And we'll get to that particularly when we get to uh, caretakers of the mentally ill, whether it's family or you're caretaking in another way, there may be some anger that's connected to that, that you may not be aware of. If you're not aware of it, you may act it out on the person. That could be a passive aggressive type of anger. But let's keep moving here. So in terms of how frequent we feel anger, I say frustration is one of the most common forms of anger. And the definition has to do with an obstacle to reaching a goal is frustration. It may be a small frustration. You wanted to make the light and the light turned red. That's a small frustration. It might be something in your career, something you'd like to achieve with your uh, marriage, your family that you're not quite achieving. That's a frustration. And this is the one of the most common feelings we experience every day, frustration. I found this painting and the title of the painting, I am sorry, I don't recall the artist, but the title is Frustration. But it's one of the most common feelings we have and it's under the umbrella of anger. If you feel frustration and you just miss the light, so your anger may be at a one out of one to 10. If it's something more major, it'll be at a higher level. Okay, these are some original definitions. We don't have to spend too much time on this. But you can see by this, if you look at all the different words, the feeling of anger has been recognized for years and years. Uh, early civilizations, the Greeks, early Greek philosophers recognized anger. And you can see it has different words and meanings in different languages. The look of anger, how do we look when we're angry? Well, the face is flushed the muscles of the brow move forward. There's a certain look to anger. We could recognize it easier in others than ourselves. Eyes may be fixed, nostrils dilate, the wings of the nose, lips open and draw back, teeth are clenched. That's a common one, clenching teeth. There's other signs of anger too that don't have to do with the face. It may have to do with uh, a nervous habit of just tapping your foot. There may be some anger in that or with, with our fingers hitting the table or something. There could be some, the harder we hit it, the more likely there's anger in it and the more, the uh, higher the level of anger. Some myths of anger, these are not true, but many people believe them, that it's a negative feeling only. It is not. And I'll get into specifics on that. That you can get rid of anger. Well, you can get rid of it in the moment, but it's gonna come back. Life is filled with angry moments. If you're alive and interacting with people, and as Sharon referenced in the introduction, what's going on in the world now, not just with mental illness, but with COVID and everything, hey, come here. isolation. About anger. Come here, you'll like it. Well, thanks for that, but you can mute it, it's great. Um, uh, you can decide not to get angry. It, it, it's visceral. Anger comes on like many feelings do. We don't recognize it always, but it comes on viscerally in the body. And then the mind, the thinking mind, the prefrontal cortex will recognize it as anger, but it's visceral. You can't decide 
deciding is a mental prefrontal cortex decision. You can't decide not to. Holding in anger is good for anger management. No, it's not. If you don't go off, you don't have an anger. No, there's an anger problem of people who are holding anger in. Revenge feels good. I hear that from people. I just don't believe it. It doesn't work for me. Once you start to get angry, you can't control it. That's not true. Venting to someone gets it out of your system, sharing yourself. Men get more angry than women do. That is not true. Women get angry just as much. Now, since I specialize also in domestic violence, I can say that men tend to do more harm. Men tend to do more harm with their anger than women do. But women get angry as well. So we're gonna, this next few slides are on destructive and constructive anger. So the Dalai Lama said, to reduce destructive emotions, we need to strengthen constructive emotions. For example, counter anger, to counter anger, we cultivate love and compassion. Now that is not so much an anger management tool, tools we usually use in the moment. This is something I think more to live by. The more love and compassion you're filled with, the less likely you are to act out anger in a destructive way. If you're filled with love and compassion for other humans, you can get angry at other people. The Dalai Lama got angry. Mother Teresa got angry for a just cause, but that doesn't mean you're gonna hurt people with your anger if you're more filled with compassion and love. So some examples of destructive anger. Toward other people, it could be abuse, bullying, intimidation, and violence. Toward the self, the self-sabotage, we may not recognize these as anger toward the self, but it is self-injury, suicide is the ultimate form, and resentment. I just wanted to say about suicide, without getting into it too much, suicide is an anger. It could be an anger also we feel toward the world and toward others. Because when the act of committing suicide is very hurtful and harmful to others as well. Number four, I have resentment. And the next slide is gonna talk a little more about resentment. I have one of my favorite, I like to use quotes. And one of my favorite people for quotes is Mark Twain. So he said, in terms of resentment, anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. If you carry around hurt, resentment, it turns into bitterness and you're carrying it around. It's harmful. Not just mentally and emotionally harmful, but physically harmful. I think a lot of us know that. Now, constructive anger. It can be useful in conflict resolution. Timeouts we take, thoughtful preparation, attentive listening. Those are all major uh, aspects of conflict resolution. Also sublimation. We can use it for creative purposes, exercise. It could fuel us toward career goals and meaningful projects that can help other people. An example of sublimation, Van Gogh, who had lots of anger in him, but he used it as an artist. He took the anger out on himself ultimately, but this is just one example of sublimation. You can turn your anger into a, a meaningful project or a, a, a great work of art. Music, art, so many people use anger to fuel that. These are examples of constructive anger. Functions of anger, it can energize us, it can disrupt us what we're doing if we're too focused on anger, it can help us communicate. Sometimes a, a lot of people have trouble getting out uh, uh, their true feelings, anger can help get it out. It can be a defensive function, it can instigate us to new projects, discriminative, judicial, a fight for justice, the just cause is a judicial function. It could be a plea for help. What's underneath the anger that someone is constantly expressing or underneath a, a temper tantrum could be a plea for help. It's part of the mourning process. If we lose someone dear to us, one of the stages of mourning is anger that we've lost that person and can be an idealizing function as well. 
Now, some of the roots of our dealing with anger. There's the psychodynamics. This is early in life, uh, childhood. What I mean by psychodynamics, it could be a, a violation we felt in childhood, an abandonment we felt. Often in childhood, we deny anger and project it onto others. Uh, other people hold the anger. We might, it might be easier to recall an angry mother or an angry father than our own anger in childhood, our own temper tantrums, what we did. It can also be learned behaviors. What did we learn in our family of origin? What about in school? What about our peers? We learn how to deal with anger from all those people as well, as well as media, movies, social media, and computer games. So this is the roots of how we deal with anger. There's more to it. Identification with parents. So we imitating parents, their behaviors. This is something that's sort of introspective for each of us to look at and how we deal with anger. Mother or father, do we copying them? Do we idealize our parents? And then it's easier to just imitate and internalize their behaviors. In our family, was it uh, an imbalance? Did mother or father have more control? Was mother or father an aggressor? Was there a victim? This is also an introspective challenge. Do we identify more with the aggressor in our family, whoever that might be, or the victim in our family? And that might determine our future choices in terms of relationship. Parenting styles, we have to look at our parents and our own parenting styles with our children. Are we too permissive? Are we too restrictive? Again, something worthy of introspection. Are we anxious and insecure of how we parent? Is it non-punitive parenting where we do, do not punish? Is it love-oriented parenting? So we have to look at the different parenting styles to see how much anger was involved in our own parents and in the parenting that we do. Now, some of the unconscious roots of anger that we may not be, may not be as easy to access. Uh, sometimes you need therapy to access the unconscious. If, you know, you need an outside uh, sort of neutral objective person to help us view ourselves. But it may, it may have had childhood trauma that we may have buried and there's anger in that. There may be a transference, something we experience with mother or father that we're now experiencing ourselves. What's the assigned role we had in our family system? There may be some anger of that. Will we consider the, uh, the funny one? Will we consider the black sheep in the family? Will we consider the favorite? Being the favorite has its obligations too. We could look at that to see if there's any unconscious roots of anger. Projection of inner badness. Any badness we feel, that we feel guilt anywhere. We may be projecting that onto others and be angry at them, but that's our own inner self that we may not be totally looking at. And then expectations of unconditionality. This is something I see a lot in the couples work I do, the couples therapy. Some people have an unconditional, uh, ex an expectation of unconditional love from mother or father. And maybe we, we did receive unconditional love from mother or father. Does that mean we have that same expectation with our adult partners? And maybe that's not fair. Maybe they're spending time thinking about themselves or, or focusing on the children, or, or they're not as available to us unconditionally as maybe our mother and father was. If we're projecting that and expecting that from a, a mate, we can get some of unconditional love, but you can't get it all the time. We're no longer children. If we're projecting that onto them, we may be angry that we're not getting that round the clock unconditionality. That as adults, we can expect some of that I'm saying, but sometimes you have to fend for yourself or turn to a friend. Man, how does anger manifest in the psyche? Psyche meaning our mental and emotional minds. There's a fight or flight, uh, which we'll get into shortly, explain that more, or freeze. There's repression, which means that sometimes we repress the anger uh, and it's sort of out of consciousness, but it's there. That's the danger of denying it 
when we may act it out because we're denying, oh, I'm not angry, that's everything's fine. Suppression is in the, it's similar to repression, but it's in the moment where it's easier to access suppressed anger, where after the fact we can say, gee, I think I might've been angry there, or why did I yell at that person? Why did I talk like that? It's easier to access. Repression is more of a, look, we all have defenses. Repression is more of a massive defense that's harder to access. And then it, depression. Freud said that depression is really anger turned inward, that we're not fully aware of it and we turn it on the self. It affects our mood, our energy level, etc. That's another form of internalized anger. And the sublimation I mentioned before is when we do good deeds or create works of art or music with our anger. So the fight or flight response, this is something all humans and animals need for survival. In moments of great stress or life or death situations, we need to have a fight or flight response that activates the body for action. We need to fight or flight the situ uh, from the situation. The, what sets off the fight or flight response is anger or fear. And we need to have it. The problem with couples who are arguing is the fight or flight response goes off and they secrete adrenaline and all of these other uh, uh, aspects of uh, physiological life, but it's not life or death. And couples sometimes argue as if it is. It's supposed to be a joke here <clears throat> where I guess it's kind of sexist in a way. The man is looking at the fight portion of the uh, bookstore. I don't know if they have bookstores anymore, but and the woman is uh, looking at the flight. But plenty of women fight and plenty of men flight. Well, that's an inappropriate joke and no one's laughing. Okay, so anger versus depression. And th because there are similarities and differences. Anger involves advancing one's position toward the other when a violation occurs. You want uh, distance from you. You want to move the other away from you so you're aggressive with them. Depression involves giving up one's position for the other when anger is unprofitable. This is the implicit aim of depression is closeness. You're feeling distant from the person you want closeness. It's more of a passive position. As I said before, anger, uh, depression can well be internalized anger. A most common anger problem that I see with patients, with friends, family, Myself, sometimes I try to avoid it. I try, I'm trying to be conscious of it. This is talking about an incident to others and avoiding facing re the relevant person directly. You can call it gossip. So many of us will complain. Do you believe this happened to me with my boss? Do you believe my wife? Do you believe my husband? They did such and such. This is common. And people don't face the person directly. We'll get to that when we get to assertive behavior in terms of how to do that. Now, instinctual aggression, I'm gonna go quickly through this. Anger is part of our instincts. You can see whether it's the tiger or the, uh, the bugs and humans to fight, as we know all too well. The functions of the aggressive instincts, it could be territorial dominance, procreation, getting a mate, this is animals and humans, parental to protect the, our children, moralistic to keep morals, predatory and anti-predatory is to protect ourselves. Sometimes aggression is necessary in those areas. Some of the contexts of anger and aggression, child abuse, domestic violence, bullying, violence, work rage, workplace rage, road, street fight, gang wars, gun violence, terrorism, and war. I didn't mention as part of the introduction before, uh, the gun violence. I'm um, quite involved now in a think tank, another organization to fight gun violence in schools and elsewhere. Road rage, another context. This is supposed to be a joke too. Road rage ahead. You get a warning. No one's laughing either. Okay, I'll try to be funnier as we go on. Uh, it, it's a serious topic, so humor is important. Aggression in the world. Now, again, illustrating how anger has been with us for so long, philosophers on anger. Plato said, when allied with reason, it could rein in baser appetites. The point Plato made is it needs to be allied with reason. It can't be just the overwhelming emotion of anger. 
I'm not going to read each of these. I want to go to uh, Seneca, who uh, in Roman times said that anger is the most hideous and frenzied of all emotion. Once allowed, it can be unbridled and ungovernable. And Descartes said, excess anger should be avoided at all costs. When used appropriately, anger provides strength to repel injury. Injury, physical injury, he meant, and psychological injury. Now what Aristotle said, this is a, a, a great anger management principle. And Aristotle said this over 2000 years ago, and anybody can become angry. That is easy. But to be angry with the right person to the right degree at the right time for the right purpose and in the right way, that is not within everyone's power and it's not easy. What I say is it is within your power, but you got to work at it. Get some help, read some books, be conscious of your anger, be aware of your anger, and then you can express it, as Aristotle said, in the right way at the right time with the right person. If you just go off any old time, it may not be a good time for the other person to hear it. Voltaire said, the greatest of all crimes, at least that which is most destructive, consequently most opposite to the design of nature is war. But there never was an aggressor who did not gloss over his guilt with the pretext of justice. I find that aggressors, uh, people who are violent, people who commit domestic violence will gloss over their guilt with the pretext of justice. They feel they had a just cause. That's why they were violent. Now, Einstein and Freud had a dialogue. Einstein knew that his principles of uh, E equals MC squared and relativity principles were being used to create bombs. Hydrogen bomb used some of his principles. He didn't want that. Einstein was a pacifist. So what did he do? He wrote to one of his contemporaries. Freud was a little older. He wrote to Freud and said, what can be done to protect mankind from the curse of war? And Freud responded, quite pessimistically, I'll say, Human instincts are of only two kinds, those which seek to preserve and unite, those which seek to destroy and kill. This instinct is at work in every living creature is striving to bring it to ruin, reduce life to its original condition of inanimate matter. There's no use trying to get rid of man's aggressive inclinations, aggressive impulses are inevitable. Freud believed in a very dualistic way, a very absolute way, in a life and death instinct. I, I believe he did not see the nuances that we've come to learn since. H.G. Wells said, again, not very optimistic, man is still what he was, invincibly bestial, envious, malicious, greedy. Man unmasked and disillusioned is the same fearing, snarling, fighting beast he was 100,000 years ago. These are no metaphors. What I tell you is a monstrous reality. I want to read this. Sheila, you got to give me more than 40 minutes, but we did have, you give, give, give me a long introduction. I'll do the best I can. Here's, but it's a beautiful quote here. Jacques Derrida, more uh, contemporary philosopher, the drive to kill will never be erased because it's part of the human animal. The human animal has a capacity for cruelty and to make the other suffer can be a source of pleasure. That isn't eradicable, but it doesn't mean we have the right to kill. This is one of the crucial functions, crucial functions of philosophy and thinking to handle that irreducible drive. Cruelty and aggression are always there, but they can be transformed into things that are beautiful and sublime. The word sublime, and we had used the word uh, sublimation before, have the same root. It can be sublime if we channel it correctly. Aggression can be transformed into something more interesting than killing. I can kill the other without putting an end to his or her life and can be aggressive in a way that's not despicable. Anger in the brain, I'm just going to cut right to this. I'm, I'm going to skip some slides as we go here. There's the low road, which we need for survival. This is when the, we sense things. It goes into the, um, the part of our brain, the, amyg the amygdala, which can turn on the fight or flight response immediately. We need that for survival. The problem is we use that low road where we're secreting adrenaline immediately when it's not a survival uh, uh, issue. Now the high road, which is much preferable if our life is not at stake, is a slow conscious system. It goes through the 
prefrontal cortex, the thinking brain, the low road bypasses that thinking brain. Again, we need it for survival, but most times in life, we're not facing survival issues. And this enables our voluntary thoughtful decision that what's called the high road, Joseph Ledoux came up with that, the low road and the high road. Impulsive anger is the low road, a bomb about to go off. Unhealthy expressions of anger, there's outward aggression, which we know whether it's physical or verbal, slamming doors, inward aggression. It could be a t a taken against the self. We touched on that before with self-sabotage or passive aggression, ignoring people, a silent treatment, refusing to do things, sarcasm, many forms of passive aggressive behavior. Mental illness in the family and anger, we're gonna get to that. I'm not sure what that means now, but let's get. These are some of the main diagnoses of anger, the DSM-5. Intermittent explosive is one of the most common ones. Oppositional, disruptive, borderline has a lot of anger and bipolar. In the manic uh, part of bipolar, there'll be anger displays and tantrums. Some of the general characteristics of mental illness, firmly rooted, stereotypical behaviors, pervasive to all areas of functioning, Incongruent affect, our affect doesn't match our thought process. Uh, it's very hard to be adaptive, we're inflexible. The defenses are rigid, it compromises our relations with others. Self-sabotaging, our psychic integrity is fragile, that's why people decompensate and have um, breakdowns, so to speak. And without treatment, symptoms of mental illness will rigidify over time, things get worse. Mental illness in the family. Many believe it happens to someone else, but it happens to approximately 44 million Americans every year approximately suffer from mental illness. One mental illness problem during your life is common. That could be depression or anxiety or panic attack. Um, these are the common disorders you can see depression, bipolar, dementia, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders. It's a brain-based condition. Some of the symptoms, unable to think, feel, or act in ways they want to. I've heard caretakers complain, um, they don't do what I expect them to do, or they don't do what um, their nurses or doctors tell them to do. Well, in many cases, if you're mentally ill, you're not even doing what you'd like to do. That's something to keep in mind when working with the mentally ill. The changes in mood, not thinking clearly, there's our thoughts and feelings, and they're caused by, it could be a combination of environmental stress, genetic factors, and biochemical imbalances. Now, the difficulties coping with mental illness, and by the way, all these difficulties and challenges for the person who's caretaking could, bring, could very well have some anger in them. So we are touching on anger here. Most families are just not prepared to cope with mental illness and they arouse strong emotions because mentally ill people pose threats to order, routine, stability, and coherence of everyday life. Now, in these changing times, we've all had lots of adapting to do, but we all need so we don't break down, so we don't go from anxiety to panic. We all need some stability in life. Granted, it's harder nowadays, the last couple of years in particular, whether it's politics, whether it's COVID, uncertainty in the world, but we need a certain amount of stability for uncertainty is the prime root of anxiety. We have a mentally ill person that we're living with, a loved one that's mentally ill. It's a disruption to that order and stability that we all need. Let's recognize that so we don't act out our anger against the mentally ill. This confusion that goes along with it, it can strike quickly, leaving us no preparation. Now in the early stages of it, when we're first dealing with it, we're novices to how to deal with mental illness. The struggles are to help the family member who is mentally ill gain access to care. Sometimes they don't want care. Sometimes they deny their illness. These are all some of the difficulties coping with more difficulties. Their behaviors may be incomprehensible, objectionable, threatening, dangerous. 
they cannot abide by the usual social norms that we expect people to abide by. Again, this is disruptive for the people who are around the loved ones of the mentally ill. They may treat caretakers sometimes with hostility. You're not getting the gratitude, you may be getting hostility. You have to deal with that. Mentally they're unable to understand their circumstance or accept the diagnosis or comply with treatment. You have to cope with, if you're caretaking, their symptoms, behaviors, emotions, uh, and also the, the volume, the volatility, the intensity of the emotion. And at the bottom, you can see some of the common emotions that people go through when dealing with mental illness in the family. Anger and resentment and guilt are, are some of them. Some people feel guilty just because they get angry toward a mentally ill uh, person. I don't believe you have to feel guilty over that. Feel guilty if you act out your anger, but the feeling itself is a normal feeling to sometimes have. In addition to love for that person, you may sometimes be annoyed or resentful toward them. If you're aware of it, you're less likely to act it out on them. People with mental disorders may show very intense, intense response to even minimal incidents. Be prepared for that. When you have a mentally ill family member, you have many questions that you may, that are filled with doubts. Are my loved one's problematic behaviors just temporary? Will the situation resolve itself? Are they truly mentally ill? Am I reading the situation correctly? Do I need to involve a, a, a mental health professional? Sometimes people think, did I do anything to bring this on? What am I doing wrong? Am I doing all I can to help? These are the normal questions to ask when you're dealing with a mentally ill person, especially a loved one. Caretakers need support too. These are some of the issues. If it's in the family, they may tell you, be the primary focus of the family. You may feel neglected at times. Uh, there's different perceptions of the problem. Sometimes family members have conflict about the solutions to the problem. You may feel helplessness, frustration, loss, or guilt. You have to balance your, the obligations you feel with the proper level of care, caregiving. If you drown because you're doing too much, you're not gonna be good to them or to yourself. Too little caretaking, you're gonna feel guilty and you're not being a, a good loved, loved, loved one, a good partner. There's chronic sorrow because you realize that person is not gonna have the, the life that they wanted, that maybe you hoped for them. If it's a child, especially, uh, and there's compassion fatigue and burnout as well. If you keep doing it too long and you're too involved, you drown in it. What are some coping skills for caregivers? Learn about the diagnosis, don't define the person by it. Spend time together, provide support, empathy, understanding. Set boundaries, make decisions together when possible. Try to involve them if it's possible. Learn the difference between helping and enabling. If you do too much, too caretaking, do every little thing for them, you're not giving them a chance, a chance to, to, to have the, 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 the self-esteem that they can do things by themselves, the ability to learn from an activity. So learn that distinction. I should have underlined that. That's important. Do your own activities to balance out your life. And these are some whether it's breathing, relaxation, mindfulness, exercise, good sleep, constructive self-talk, we can get through this. Plan for emergencies that often happen with the mentally ill, breakdowns, suicidal thoughts, violence could happen. Accept partial solutions when they occur. Be realistic. In other words, focus on what you can do. A small triumph could be very meaningful for the mentally ill. And try to recognize that when it happens. Express your anger and frustration in a compassionate, constructive manner. Work on being sad instead of just mad all the time. There's a sadness to it, recognize that. And I did underline this, draw the illness person distinction. This dichotomy is a valuable tool. You can be angry more if you take at the illness itself than that the person who did not willingly, voluntarily bring it on. If you just keep anger toward the person, that anger may become excessive. If you realize there's an Ill illness there, that's a distinction that's important to draw. Now, I've done some research in terms of 
and you can have your own views on this, but four primary stages uh, when you're caretaking for mentally ill family member. Before the diagnosis, a lot of confusion, this emotional anime is really from the French. It's sort of a bewilderment that your life has been disruptive. It's a breakdown. And that happens when this first occurs because your life is going from coherence and predictability to chaos and disorder. The diagnosis briefly provides, provides a mental, medical frame that clarifies the situation. And initially there may be hope, compassion, and sympathy, but then a sense of permanency kicks in where the initial optimism that uh, they can be fixed goes away to a sense of permanency. And efforts cannot change things, meaning the recognition leads to relief from the burdensome belief that you're due to solve it. You can help, you can be supportive, but the chances are you cannot solve the problem. You cannot fix them. You cannot get them onto road to be better health. The earlier slide that talked about some of the rigidity in the character of mentally ill, the rigidity to us. And some of that rigidity hardens over time. It's hard to give up this hope that you can fix things and change things, not just for the mentally ill, but sometimes people are trying to change their partners. And you can be supportive, but if you try to change things, you're gonna get in the way and you're gonna cause more anger and disruption. So some of the four C's that could help caretakers. I did not cause it. I cannot control it. I can't cure it. All I can do is cope with it. The acceptance the idea that can't control another person's illness and not responsible for their fate. A resignation of the in an acceptance of the ineffectuality to change the course of their mental illness. It can relieve their uh, discomfort and the suffering can diminish. When you because you keep trying to change things, you're knocking your head against the wall. It's hard to give that up. It really is. I mean, I do a lot of caretaking in my life. I'm a therapist, and um, part of me never gives up, really. But. At a certain point, you may realize that you can only do so much. You can be supportive, you can be understanding, you can be empathic, but you may not be able to change that person. While disagreements and tension are inevitable in any family, the manner in which conflict is handled is what differenti differentiates the healthy family from a toxic family system. How do you handle conflict? How do you deal with anger? And in this picture, you can see the children are suffering. The little baby suffering doesn't have much con cognitive recognition as a little girl here who's a little older and has an idea what's going on. She looks like she's been through it before. In terms of the impact on children, when they have mentally ill parents, it's a major risk for their development. They have a higher risk of developing mental illness, illness. When both parents are mentally ill, the chance is greater. The higher risk when a parent has more than one mental disorder. It can be inherited through genes, inherited through learned behaviors. It's an unpredictable family environment. It puts stress on the marriage and affects the parenting abilities of the couple. These are some of the ways that children suffer. Not just with mental illness, but with domestic violence, as you can see in this picture here. Some of the protective factors for children that they have when they're able to reach a certain age that the parent is mentally ill and they are not to blame. You know, when children are very young, it's sort of a child-centric world. They think they caused it, the illness, they caused the violence, they caused the divorce. A lot of children go through that. I see as a therapist, that adults who talk about their childhood a lot of them felt that they caused it. You have to help them with that. Uh, if they have a stable home environment, that could be helpful. Therapy can be helpful. The sense that they're being loved, at least by one parent, can be really crucial for a child. And then all the other protective factors here in school, friends, interest, and getting support somewhere and attention somewhere if they're not getting it from their parents. The double bind theory is just briefly mentioned. This has been mentioned as a possible cause, not just a genetic cause, but 
uh, a family environment cause when you're getting conflicting messages. A lot of us have gotten that and have overcome it. And we don't have a mental illness. When your parents say one thing and then they contradict that. An example is at the bottom. You must love me. Well, a child may not feel they love that parent every moment of the day. Don't be scared. The child may be scared, but they feel a, 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 some sort of compulsion to go along with what the parent says, to believe the parent. That presents an inner conflict. You're feeling fear and, you're, and your parent is saying, you're not, don't be afraid. A lot of parents do that. You must go to sleep. So you may be feeling something else. And the classic double bind is, that a lot of us get is, grow up already. Do this, do that, you can accomplish this. But then they also get the message, verbal or nonverbal, you're my baby. I need you. Stay with me. I love you more than anyone will ever love you. Those kind of messages with the grow up message are conflicting messages. Creates a double bind for the young mind of a child to try to comprehend. It's very difficult. Some anger management tools. These are some basic tools. I'm going to specify some of them, not all. Taking a time out when things get too heated, you're too heated, or the other person's too heated. Timeouts can really save a lot of, can save violence, it can save a lot of bad words that couples say to each other, insults that can be very hurtful, that people remember, that stay with us, whether they voice them or not. And these are some of the other tools. I'll get into some of them here. Start with classifications of behavior. This is very important to learn these distinctions, passive aggressive, passive aggressive, and the healthiest assertive. When is it okay to be passive? Well, if you're too heated, the other person's too heated. The other person got bad news, there's a loss, there's depression going on, there's other people around, then it's okay to be passive. But don't make it a regular habit because then you're stuffing your feelings, keeping it in. And these are some of the characteristics of passive behavior. And if you look at the last one on the list, you can only be passive for so long. If you keep holding on to it, pretty soon it's going to leak out. One definition of passive aggressive behavior is anger that leaks out is passive aggressive. It's not direct, but little things you may do that hurt the other person. So holding on to anger, being passive too long, no good. Aggressive behavior. Is where you just care about yourself. You're pushing your own agenda. You're disregarding the other person's feelings, boundaries, their rights. You're disowning their uh, feelings because you're just externalizing, acting them out, and you lack empathy for the other. We all know what aggression, and by the way, all of us have some aggression in us. Some of us have a lot more than others. Try to recognize it so you don't act it out. Passive aggressive behavior. Some people say this is so, so annoying because it's an indirect expression of anger. It's a veiled put down. How can I say, oh, you look so nice today. That could imply you didn't look nice yesterday. I mean, there's so many things. Uh, where'd you get that uh, dress? Where'd you get that uh, shirt? I mean, just things people do, a veiled put down. Faux humor, jokes at other people's expense. Sarcasm can be another. Omissions, oh, I forgot. Omissions, excuses. So with passive aggressive behavior, there's a resentment or an anger you're carrying inside and it, and it leaks out and hurts the other person indirectly, but they feel it. People are aware when you're being passive aggressive. And here's a cartoon, take two twice a day to help control rage. By the way, I put them in a childproof bottle and overcharged you. That's passive aggressive, bordering on aggression almost. Pretty direct, okay. The healthiest, assertive behavior, where you can take risk. It says risk confrontation, because confrontation is always a risk. By confrontation, I don't mean a nasty argument. I just mean bringing something up, putting it on the table, so to speak. It doesn't have to be in someone's face. It could be, you know, I'd like to talk to you about something. Is this a good time? That's a healthy way to bring up something assertively. I'd like to talk to you about what happened last night. Is this a good time? So with assertive behavior, you're bringing it up in a secure way, but you're considering the other person's needs and feelings. 
You're flexible and sensitive in the moment. Meaning, let's say you bring something up, but you see the other person seems hurt. You could flexible in the moment, you could back off and say, okay, hold on, uh, how are you feeling now? You don't have to carry through with your full agenda because you're in the moment. It's the only one of the other, of all the four behaviors where you're creating your response in the moment. You're thinking it's a moment. The others, whether you're passive or aggressive, passive aggressive, they tend to be automatic. They tend to be things you've done in the past. When you're being assertive, you're truly in the moment with the other person. It's the hardest to do because you're doing two things at once. You're voicing how you feel, you're expressing your needs, that's one. And two, simultaneously, you're being considerate and sensitive to the other person. If you could pull that off and your partner pulls it off, you're going to probably have a pretty healthy relationship, assertive behavior. Dealing with the anger of a loved one. Know yourself, know what you're feeling, practice assertive behavior, know your limits, your feelings, manage your anger before you approach the other person. Keep an appropriate distance, especially if you're angry, don't get too close. Use eye contact, maintain an open body stance, validate what you hear from the other person, be calm and clear in your voice, set boundaries in terms of what you need, and maybe you need a timeout, even if you're doing it correctly. Next, conflict resolution. <clears throat> the four main stages, the timing of when you bring something up, that's why I say check in, say, is this a good time? I'd like to talk to you. Preparation, you may rehearse beforehand how you want to say it. Expression, do it assertively in a calm, low voice. And listening, be prepared for a response. If you don't get one and you're truly considerate and assertive, you may say, please tell me how you feel about that. Some tips, you're sitting at the same level of standing. Not one person sitting, standing above the other. Eye contact, eye statements, we all know what that is. Rather than say, you did this or you didn't do that, say, I feel this or I need that. It's not a criticism. It's an expression of need. Your voice is moderate. You don't interrupt. Your voice talk and stick to one subject. In other words, you may bring something up and the other person then uses it as an excuse to bring a lot of things up, or you do. Let them bring it up at a, at a separate time. Uh, and I wanna, uh, absolutes number 14, rather than say you always do it or you never do it, those are absolutes, they're not true. Even if you thought they were true, they're hurtful. They don't, they don't uh, work toward conflict resolution. And of course, the last one, ending the relationship should not be mentioned or implied, like I've had enough of this. I can't take you anymore. Should we get a divorce? We need to separate. You may have those thoughts enter your mind, but when you, when you frequently imply it or mention ending the relationship, it doesn't last. It's just hurtful. You're going to get back together. And then you're in a cycle where you have an argument. You talk about ending a relationship. You don't. And then you'll get back in the cycle again. That's why it should not be mentioned or implied. Couples hurt each other so much with that. Some triggers of anger, another anger management tool. Uh, Albert Bandura, a behaviorist, talked about these four triggers, which makes sense. David Biscott, the late David Biscott, who did a radio show for years in LA, he talked about these six triggers of anger that will get anyone angry. And I came up with 20 triggers, Dr. Michaels, 20 triggers of anger. There are more. These are some of the main ones I've come across. The left uh, column seems to be a little milder. Excuse me. The right side, pretty intense triggers. Devaluation, condescension, injustice, accusation, deception. These are pretty intense triggers. Now, when I give these out in my groups, anger management groups, domestic violence groups, I ask people to evaluate each trigger. Is that mild for you? Like interruption is mild for most people, but maybe it's moderate or is it intense for you? That's part of knowing yourself before you approach another person with any angry feeling. Know yourself, know what really triggers you and other things are much milder for you. 
the deeper work. We're getting toward the end now. Processing versus acting out. Try to process feelings rather than act on them immediately. Some things that happen that go down between couples or between you and your child, you and your sister, your brother, a family member, need to be thought about, need to be processed, either with a therapist or try to do it yourself. But process it rather than just acting out as more of an immediate impulsive response. Overcoming self-righteous anger. Some of us are so committed to our cause and so certain we're right. And I say this, even if a thousand people say, you know what, you are right. If you have a self-righteous tone, the other person's not gonna hear it. There's a certain humility <laughs> that if you think you're right, you need to, to have that humility when you're expressing yourself to the other. Take responsibility for your own behaviors if you hurt someone else or your anger was out of line. So Dr. Levitin, can we sort of bring it to a close? Yes. So people can ask you questions. Okay, yes, 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 yes. We would love to be able to ask you questions. I think I can do this in a minute and a half. Okay. You're not going to be angry with me, are you, Sharon? No, no. It's a joke, it's a joke, okay. Yes. <laughs> Trying to get a laugh here. I'm dying here, okay. <laughs> That's what comics say, I'm dying up here, okay. Um, developing empathy for another can be a very useful tool. And I'll talk about empathy in a minute. And I even have something of uh, anger management, Buddhism, blaming, which is so common. But there are reasons people blame. You feel you have control of the situation because there's a, a need. When something bad happens, spilling a glass of milk or a certain argument that happens, there's a need for attribution. Who did it? Who caused it? And our first re response is usually not me, not me. We don't want to feel guilty. We don't want to feel an inner badness, which I mentioned earlier. Empathy, based on making attempts to feel the feelings of another, easy to achieve when we've had that experience ourselves. We can still learn empathy, even if we didn't get it from mother or father. Empathy is best taught by active demonstration. You can't tell someone to be empathic, you show them empathy and maybe you'll get more of it from them. It can requires capacity to connect to our own feelings. It can lessen the intensity of anger and resentment. If you can feel for the other person, you're not gonna act out as intensely your anger, which is what the next uh, says, the next one. And it broadens our perspectives on, pers on other people, other cultures. Empathy is a valuable tool for many reasons. There's a quiz if anyone wants to see the power. Some people mention you want to see this PowerPoint after, I can provide it. And the last thing I'll say is I'll end with this slide. Anger management and, and Buddhism. If you become angry or afraid, there's a natural kind of adrenaline principle. When you actually start to speed up, that's what happens with adrenaline, with anger. Use the speeding up to bring you back to the present. Use it as a reminder to slow down and listen and look and develop patience. Learn to pause and allow yourself and others some space. This involves self-awareness, self-recognition. Hey, I'm speeding up. Maybe I need to pause and take a moment. The last one, the way to help and becoming a complete human being is to no longer hold so tightly to yourself. You long to go beyond that situation. You are no longer afraid of yourself. You don't feel that you need a protected place to hide it. You can be free to be yourself which, and part of being yourself and a complete human being is being aware of and sensitive and compassionate to others. Thank, Thank you. you. Michael, this was such a great talk with all the references to Plato, uh, <laughs> Aristotle, uh, Nietzsche. It was so great. It was very broad and it was very helpful and you went through absolutely everything with anger management. Let's take off your PowerPoint so people can ask you questions. Great. Okay. So here we are. We've got our, our gallery of people. And uh, if you will raise your hand or I will try to manage this and call on you if you have a question for Dr. Leviton. And thank you. I thought the talk was very comprehensive and very healing and helpful Thanks. and educational. Yes. How do I get a full screen where I can see everyone? Go up to gallery on the top right. I did it. Thanks. Yeah, Thank the you. gallery on the top right. So anybody have a question here? I'm 
So, uh, Mitch, I see you, Mitch. You have your, this is Mitch Reeves, Dr. Leviton. Yes. Mitch, Hello, Dr. Ahead. Leviton. Hi, Sharon. Happy New Year. Yes. Happy New Year to you. you. I have a question. My son has had schizoaffective for about 11 years. He's doing well, and then he had a psychotic break about eight months ago, and he's not really recovering well. He's very low key um, to himself, very isolated, but at times he gets violent, like he kicks in his door. And I try to uh, communicate with him. He lives with me and I'm here all day. And I was just wondering if you had any strategies that I could do to try to get him out of it. We've switched his medication. He gets an injectable every month and we switched it from uh, Respir Respiridol to Ambilify. Maybe that'll make a difference just a few days ago. But right now he's just so into himself and I'm concerned because another psychiatrist said, if you don't, it's like an earthquake. If you don't erupt a little bit once in a while, you'll have these big explosions. So any strategies so that he doesn't have these big eruptions? I'll tell you what comes to mind. He, uh, one is um, his anger is, it sounds to me like it's a, uh, Say, uh, a righteous anger. It's an anger that he, he probably has lots to be angry about. He probably has some awareness that he's not, quote, normal like his friends or other people he knows or people he's not, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that he, he probably doesn't, but he has really no insight uh, to what's going on. Okay, if I can continue, yeah. he, he must have some awareness that he's different. There has to be some awareness. Okay. So his anger is a righteous anger. He needs an outlet. Rather than have the door that he kicks in, I would provide something else in his room or somewhere in the house that is safe that he could he could kick or hit or do something with, something safe. And also, I'd say, uh, is, does he uh, seem to uh, uh, comprehend when you talk to him, uh, Mitch? Yeah, but he stopped talking about three, four weeks ago. He barely, does he, does he comprehend when you talk? Yes. Oh, he does. Okay. You could talk to him about, you can understand where he's angry. He has lots to be angry about. And he needs a safe outlet for it. And provide that somehow. It could be a... Some bag he could hit or something, or a pillow or something. Yeah, because he does nothing. He, he doesn't read, doesn't watch TV, just sits or stands. Well, you, well, you know, he needs, I don't know, is he under treatment? Yeah, well, yeah, uh, minimal. I'm trying to maybe find a different psychiatrist or something to go through, but right is now. He, is, he under, is, is he under any treatment that's not uh, 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 med medical treatment? Uh, not really. They, they, any, they any, kind of ther any kind of therapy. We have a therapist that comes once every few weeks, and he he doesn't like to talk to them. Oh, okay. So it's not, that's not really helping. He's not really at, at a stage for cognitive help right now. It's more uh, we got to clear up what's going on in his brain. So that's a very helpful suggestion, Dr. Leviton. Let's go on to another question. Thank you. Yes. Yes, so Garrett, you have your hand up. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Dr. Leviton, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, I'd like to ask you a question. What do you do in a situation when you're communicating to a loved one that you feel hurt and you're angry, and then the loved one gets angry at your anger? Well, you just said you're communicating your hurt. Are you right. communicating that with anger? But so, maybe some anger, but also some, you know, real, uh, real points. I, I feel I have some real points ah. in my, in, I have some real things to communicate that make me angry. So, you know, even, even with trying to communicate it in a loving way, the, the person still gets angry. All right. Well, Garrett, I would say this. When you say you have real points, it sounds like like you've thought about it, what the situation is, and you have some logical points that make sense where the other person either did something or or, or failed to do something that you needed. And um, be aware of this. It's almost like you're entering a different territory. 
once you start expressing emotion. And some people, you know, we all have right brain, left brain, and we, we use them both. But the right brain is more emotional. Once you're entering more emotional territory, the logic sometimes doesn't, the logic could feel like, like uh, it could be like you're expressing something you've thought about. It makes perfect sense to you. But to the other person, it might be like a, a jab, like a, like a sting inside, because each one hurts. So I'd say this to you. And there, and there's, is that, and there she is right there. <laughs> no, 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 that's my mom. No. Okay, no, no. Thank you for that insight. Yeah. Yeah, that, one more thing I want to say. Please, please. That if you're hitting a person with a lot of logical points, even if you're quote correct and making sense, everyone can, has a limit what they can handle. I would start with one little thing and also mm. express it. I mentioned this, I think, during the talk. Express it more as I need or I would appreciate rather than you failed to do this. So why did you do that? Express it as, man, it means a lot to me when you do such and such, something like that. Build on something they have done and express it as a way, gee, I, I love when you do that, or I need more of that, or this would help. And then I would follow that with, what do you need from me maybe that I'm not providing? That's mm. assertiveness, where you're considerate of the other person. And don't hit them with a lot of logic. <laughs> I already did. <laughs> I, I've already launched the email, so uh, un unfortunately, this is this this will have to be uh, the email. This, oh my god! Put it in drafts. Too late. Yeah, too late for drafts. But uh, I appreciate your input and thank you for the wisdom. Thank you. Yes. So thank you. So anybody else have a question for? Dr. Janice, your hand is up. This is Janice Black. Hi, Hi, doctor. Thank you so much. We all really appreciate this topic. So you said a lot about learned behaviors and the roots of how we learn. Do we identify with the aggressor or the victim? Right. So I want to ask you about adult sibling abuse. Anger starts young and the parents don't make that child accountable the older child is aggressive to the younger child, children and no, when they say that again the older child why? the older hear. child can be very aggressive to the younger child but the parents say oh it's nothing uh, leave it alone leave it alone so when the child grows up to be an adult there's a lot about adult sibling abuse and nobody you know they talk about your spousal abuse or your husband or wife girlfriend boyfriend but people don't talk about the uh, adult sibling. And you said something interesting, without treatment, mental illness gets worse. And you talked about the aggressors floss over the guilt. And I find oh, that- that was, they, the quote, that was the quote from, uh, who was that, Voltaire? I think. But go on, go on, Janice. Go so on. essentially, aggressors don't apologize they think they're always right and when they become old like six over 60 and they've been doing this since they were eight years old and you know when people say oh that person's never going to change but how do you deal with the anger when that person's already an adult adult you know they're almost 60 years old and they don't they're never accountable and the family always aligns with them and it's very hard well, you know, you're bringing up a, a large topic. It sounds like it's a, a family systems issue. And one of the things that uh, early in life people are, and it's not usually a conscious process, but they're assigned roles in the family, in a sense. The children, this one's this one, this one. Okay. So, you know, when you're talking about an aggressor, uh, it is harder to change when you get older. Without treatment, I don't see how people can change when they're 60 years old, especially if they're not making an effort to change. Uh, I think what, what, what um, might be helpful, because you also said they never apologize, is the uh, same thing with empathy. Show them empathy, apologize to them, and you're demonstrating something. Whether they catch on or not, you... You know, another thing I said is we can't change people. We can, we can guide them, we can support them, we can show them the way, 
not, not with our words, but with our actions, when we're empathic, when we're apologetic, when we take responsibility. That's about all we can do, really. You know, I watched something, it was a show on killer siblings on o, o, Oprah's network. And this forensic psychiatrist said, you cannot always blame when some of these kids do these crazy, insane things. You cannot always blame it on mental illness. You can't say, oh, it's mental illness. They're, it's something deep inside, this, this doctor was saying, deep inside of them that is not a mental illness because it's never been diagnosed and you, there's nothing... Di there's nothing you could diagnose with that act that they did that is so horrendous but i wish that we could come out with something about siblings and abuse when they're little because i think a lot of people ignore it and i notice a lot of trouble when people are adults and they don't change and they still treat the family member the same that they did for the last 50 years or well it, it sounds like there's a failure of parenting going on if they're always uh, excusing uh, the younger, younger siblings being hit, it sounds like a failure of parenting and neglect in, you know, to tune in. But it also sounds, Janice, like, uh, I don't know if you're talking personally or not, but uh, you, you mentioned something about the family aligns with the aggressor. So there's something out of, out of whack with this whole family system. Hopefully it's not yours, but... Well, thank you. Thank you, Doc. Also, by the way, sibling abuse, since I do specialize in abuse, it's so much less common. So unfortunately, there's a lot less written and research about it. But it's it's a dearth in the field of uh, psychology and in the, in the literature. Yeah. There's nothing written about it. It's very, very rare. Very rare. You should write something. I, I wrote something. I, I hear a book. You, a, there's a little bit about it. <laughs> Janice, you can find a little bit about it. Yeah. But so, you're right. th Not thank enough. you. Thank you, Dr. Levitin. Any other questions this evening? I believe there's an iPhone who's been very patient, has had their hand up, and then Abby, and then maybe we'll close out the night with those two questions. Okay. So, the iPhone. Uh, hello, Dr. Levitin. This is John McKenna. Where are you? I'm in Rhinebeck, New York. No, I know that. I know. Wait, wait. I want to get you on my screen. Are you on the uh, screen or are you shy? No, I, I don't have the video up. But I, oh, come I was. On. Thank okay. you. Thank you for covering all these issues on anger. On the eve of January 6th, I'd like your take on <laughs> um, the rationale or the, the communal or cultural side of anger. And uh, what, are, what, are, what do you see as some of our challenges uh, on a macro sense of people expressing their anger in these very large wholesale, you know, uh, acts of behavior. Um, you know, we're hearing about escalation of air rage, um, obviously January 6th. Um, is, this a, is this a phenomenon that, that you feel we can even tackle on a macro level? Well, and then I, I have a, yeah. Well, I, I think it's, um, it's an old term, you know, mob mentality. There's something about, uh, it starts with really the need for community. Now on, on its face, when I say need for community, it has sort of like an optimistic, wholesome feel to it, need for community. However, just like so many, excuse me, so many things in life, it can go off the tracks where that need for community means a need to join others. It may be a need that people have to, to, uh, to worship uh, in, in a religious sense. It may be a need to worship in, in, a, in another sense, a, a political figure. It may be a need to, but just as there's a need for community, the, the anger can be communal in a sense that it's almost like it's cont contagious. It's, it's almost like it's, it's, it's people band together and they're getting something. See, one of the things, uh, uh, you know, as a psychologist and, and now looking at, as you say, John, the macro level, um, you you want to look at what function does it serve or what functions. And something like January 6th and, and is, is a, a need for community, a need to belong, a need to perhaps there was not enough sense of belonging in, in their family. 
or maybe some of these people were loners at some point with not enough friends or, or, or good friends. And, and it, could, it could be almost like that need can, can, can go in, an, in a bad direction where people are destructive with their anger, with their community. That's my immediate thought. Wow, thank you. Thank you, wow. Yeah, that's profound, very profound. So and Sharon, yeah. to, to one more word on it. Like, like what function does it, that's what to look at. I want to highlight that. What function does it serve? It's not just a function of uh, going into the Capitol and, and doing harm and, and deciding an election. There's that deeper need on a psychological level to, psychological level to belong. A sense of community. Yeah, sense Just of community. Just like we're, wait, we're a community and we like to think we're doing good. NAMI is a community. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you so. So last question, uh, we had the last question. Erin, uh, who was that? Abby has her hand raised. Abby, okay. Hi, um, thank you so much for this talk. It's really been Wonderful. So this actually is a personal story. Um, I have a son with anxieties. He's in his 20s. We live in different cities. He came to visit me and I, we were talking and I said one sentence that was very gentle, but it triggered him. And what happened after that was him yelling and screaming, just nonstop going on this major tirade. Our family's been through lots of therapy. So to try and break that screaming and yelling, I went outside to take a walk. And because he has separation anxieties, even in his 20s, he followed me screaming and yelling nonstop and I just couldn't break the screaming and yelling and yeah it was just awful so what do you do when you try to get away from somebody in that kind of situation okay uh you said you're in different cities but in this incident you were in the same place yeah, he's on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast. He came to visit me. And, and, um, and how old is he? He is 26. Okay. All right. So I have a couple of thoughts. One is that you said you said something, one sentence, very gentle. Yes. So it sounds to me like um, that's your perspective. One right. sentence, very gentle. It was not yes. his. It was not right. his. Right. And um, I don't know, what you need to do at some point to minimize the chances it will recur is to find out what was so upsetting. And if he opens up on that, I would not interrupt, even if he says something you don't agree with. Let's right. say he says, um, mom, you were screaming at me from the start. Right. And you know, Abby, you said, no, I wasn't screaming. You don't verbalize that. Once he starts talking, this is what I said earlier to, I think it was Garrett. It's not about the logic. It's not about the facts. Here's right. what I say. When you're dealing with facts, you know, that's good for business and science and investment and this and that and banking, you know, a lot of facts mean a lot. When you're dealing with personal family stuff, I say feelings over facts. So the mm -hmm. fact is, in your mind, one sentence, very gentle, but the feeling is very different for him, from him. Right. Now the other, and one more thing I want to say on this. When you say you thought taking a walk would be good, um, I don't know how you took the walk. The, the paper I did not display, I didn't, couldn't display them all, was uh, timeouts. And with the timeout, you, timeouts is, before it happens, before the argument, you know, you'd let the person know at some point, you know, if things get really heated between us. It's right. not a claiming statement. If we get into an argument, you're not saying when you lose it or when you, you don't do that. When we, or between us, you use those joining words, we and us. 
um, a timeout may be necessary. So you let the person know in advance. And if your son or anyone you're dealing with has a uh, extreme separation issue, before I would walk out of the house, I might say, uh, I'd like to take a break now. I think that might be best. How do you feel about that? You give them a heads up. Right, but you, you know what? in a gentle way, yeah. Sorry, there was no heads up. He was already- um, no, was there, you, a, have to, you have to provide the heads up that you're leaving. Which I did. did you get, with someone like that with an extreme separation anxiety issue, I would say, are you okay with that right now? Because that let's say did. whatever he objected to earlier, in that moment when you say, are you okay with that right now, you're showing consideration. You're showing in his mind that you do care. Got it. That might work. Okay, way, any of thank, these, you. Any, thank you. Any anger management tool or anything we've talked about, there's no guarantees it's gonna work 100% of the time. All you're right. doing with an anger management tool or a stress management tool or anxiety management tool, you're very much trying to increase the chances that it will work, but nothing's guaranteed in life. Because people, not just mentally ill, but people can be unpredictable. <clears throat> thank you. Dr. Levitin, we thank you so much. It's been a very powerful talk, a very healing talk with a lot of knowledge for us, a lot of helpful tools and some of the most amazing quotes I've seen in a long time. <laughs> so, so, which is helpful for us to think about anger. So we really appreciate you so much. I knew you would not disappoint us. Thank you Thank so you. much. Let's give him a round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give Dr. Levitin a round of applause. He's Thank a gift you. to our community. Thank you. To, wow. to helping anger management and helping families manage anger. He's a total gift to our community. And thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for the opportunity. How can we re